And now, we'll hear a wide-ranging conversation between Lasky, paranormal investigator Vinnie Carbone, and mystic artist and spiritual healer Lou Flores. The first two voices you'll hear are Lasky and Flores, as they wonder about why we separate what is supernatural or paranormal from the rest of experience. You know, why we think that there is shame or why we think that there is this kind of like disconnect between the synthesis of talking all these things together. You know, I think of even the way that we think about like learning systems in a school. A lot of times we like make this binary dichotomy between science and the humanities, you know, which is (laughs) not even supernatural. I mean, just anything artistic or books and, and we sort of like kind of pit you know, those sides against each other. Why do you, why do we think that it's so hard to talk about, um, you know, in, in maybe in circles that we might talk to or just talk to someone in the grocery store about, you know, about ghosts or about the supernatural? Why is there that stigma or that shame? Do we feel like if we feel it's true or, I mean, I'd love to, and I know for myself, yeah, there's always like a little bit of, um, a little bit of that when I try to talk to people, but it's even, yeah, really interesting to hear what both of you say, you know, because when you when you say you're a paranormal investigator, do people, you know, question it and do you feel have to feel like on the defensive about it or something? Oh, well, I, I love the idea of like us talking about what is really the norm, right? Because yeah, we- exactly. So for years, I was actually very in the closet about being a paranormal investigator. You know, I had to feel people out first before I would share that information. Um, just because uh, naturally I thought people were going to think I was crazy. And so the first time it kind of turned around for me was when I went to my high school reunion. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I had kind of started to post a, a few videos on, uh, you know, like on Facebook or interviews that I may have done or something like that. And I went back, I went to my high school reunion. And, you know, these are people I haven't really seen in like 10 years at that time. And what I found out much to my pleasant surprise was that, you know, I had kind of had people coming up to me like, Oh, you do that ghost stuff. And then they were all telling me their ghost stories. And then they were asking me questions. I was like, Oh, you know what? Way more people are into this than, than might let on. Now, conversely, I went for a job interview a couple of years back. And um, part of the job interview was that I had to go through a psychological evaluation told him about, you know, how I was commissioned to write a play. And he asked me what the play was about. And I told him, oh, you know, and I knew what he was looking for. And I, so I very, was careful with my words. And I said, well, supposedly the house is haunted. So they wanted me to write a play about the ghost. I could have said the house is haunted. So I wrote a play about the ghost, right? I think, for, I think the big reason why people might not, might hesitate when it comes to this topic is because, as human beings, we, we love to justify and we love to have explanation. And if there's a world in which ghosts are real, well, then what the hell else could there be out there? You know, we like to be in control. Um, I, I definitely agree with many, um, but also I think there's layers of colonialism and racism. That's absolutely oh, for sure. Conversation, you know, and I know that you know, you know, right, but I just you know, want to name that in the conversation just because um, there's very intentional, like, historical ways in which, um, in, in which, like, we try and like make people, or you know, we, we classify people as ignorant the more that they like think about witchcraft or ghosts or like what have you. And that that was a very, like, very intentional, um, strategic way of, um, of, of um, having us all, you know, kind of give up our cultures, you know? And so there's a, a little bit of a code switch as well. Like, I know the way that I talk to, like, my, you know, my other, like, POC folk sometimes is very different from the way that I talk to, like, white community or white friends. And so, and it's, it's just a, you know, it's a, I, it's a rephrasing, you know, like Vinny was talking about supposedly, right? Like mm-hmm. all the different ways in which we kind of like couch experience, you know, to be able to kind of make it more palatable or like, you know, that kind of thing. And I do that all the time. I mean, hello, as a professional witch, like, right? Like, I mean, come on. Uh, so that, that's all to say, like, 
uh, there's there's just a the, for me it's like the, it, there's a intentional strategy around keeping us away from things like and not that ghosts can empower us i mean i think that they can but i think like supernatural investigations they're like talking about like Vinny was talking about like control and ways in which like we start to look at things outside of our personal like control of the environment that's where it can get a little bit radical and start to put ideas in people's heads about like well what is autonomy you know like what is the soul you know how do i feel liberated in the body like what does that mean to like leave my you know can i you know how do i leave myself or you know all these kind of ideas of like all the implications of having ghosts um so i think that there there's a little bit of a power dynamic on top of it um you know and i'm not saying everybody has that but but just as like the sub the, the over culture kind of you know um the more that we distance ourselves from the lands distance ourselves from like seeing things as being normalized um and and consistently like speaking to you know and i know this might sound crazy but like you know seeing the spirits of a tree or being in conversation like in environment where it's not just like i'm praying to this, the tree but i'm seeing like the whole totality of how it holds its space you know, kind of idea um anyway so i i just wanted to throw those things out there um and also just like that i i love the fact that we can have tool sets of, you know, tools or ways of kind of quantifying experience, but also, uh, and not that that isn't important, but also like, I'm not, I'm not going to dismiss my personal like body space, um, just because I don't have like this, it's not a static, you know, on this, on, like on a static scale or like that kind of stuff. So you know, like I, I'm a little bit wary of having to quantify my experience for somebody else in that way. Not that I think that Vinny at all is, you know, talking about that and, you know, but, and of course that's part of, you know, um, investigation, right? Like, you know, having quantifiable proof that something's there, but what, you know, how do we kind of, what are the other spectrums of quantifying, you know, experience? there's, I don't know, there's just so many places where we try and confine um possibility or try and confine what what is in our spaces and like there's just a non-acknowledgement you know how much do we not acknowledge it's just inherently there you know in the everyday um, yeah that's, my thoughts, yeah that's what surprised me about it you know when i saw a ghost is how it was not like Ooh, you know like hey you know i'm trying to scare you i'm trying it was just simply looked as normal as anything else it wasn't yeah it wasn't um yeah it just wasn't anything extraordinary like the sublime hiding in plain sight you know i always kind of related the paranormal to an onion and that you just have different scenes different things layered on top of each other wrapped around each other like a ball of twine you know or layered um just kind of playing out in their own doing their own thing well, and one thing that I, that I really loved in, in, you know, your writing was this idea of like presence and residue and how ghosts, you know, that there can be a, um, even like in the idea of multidimensionalness of ghosts, right? That, that there are some that are residuals of a, uh, of, um, of a soul, you know, there's a, there's a place where it has been in that, that like waiting for itself or, you know, this longing for itself. But also that there there can be experiences of like self awareness and you know um, that a ghost can also be future looking in certain ways if that makes sense that it's not just in the longing or in the residue or in the wake of itself that there can be a like there can be moments of self awareness and engagement and interaction. One question is you know I know we talked about like spaces being um hunted or re residues or whatever and um i wonder do we feel that art and art objects or just objects in general have a consciousness or a will of some sort or is it related to what you know we've been talking about about a space having that energy that residue and that gets rubbed on the object but i just think about specifically art you know when an artist i know and i don't mean to use the big a in an elitist way but you know like when when like an artist creates something does it have a will does it have a consciousness does it have a kind of life of its own 
certainly I do believe that, you know, if I as an investigator am willing to believe that a house could be haunted, why not a mirror, a piano, a couch, or, you know, uh, a car? So, yeah, I think I think it's absolutely possible. I think it's a, I, 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 yeah, I think so. Absolutely. And that was brilliant. I love that. Um, yes. It kind of gives me the idea of like, can our work be haunted too, right? And about all the like, whether it's racial slurs or things that have really negative like connotations and what about that like makes that a haunted thing or you know what I mean? Like outside of the, the definition, but even just the word itself can feel haunted, right? So yes, absolutely. I think that, that art can be haunted, poems can be haunted. Um, and that hauntings aren't evil. Like there can actually be a good haunting maybe, or like there can be like a, like there can be a good residue. There, there is a very mis, there's a very unfortunate misconception by people outside of the paranormal community that, you know, ghosts equates to bad or evil. But you know, what I've always said is that it's not a matter of is, is a place haunted or the ghost is out to settle a score, it's, you know, what, why are they still haunting the place? If they were cool in life, they're going to be cool in death. They might just be hanging out to check you out, or they may not even know they're dead. Oh, but if they got unfinished business, they've got unfinished business. That doesn't make them, you know, a bad person or a bad spirit. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely a, uh, an unfortunate misconception. Thing. I remember one time I went to like this um, forest that everybody says was haunted and I had a student and she said, oh, that, you know, that place is very noisy. <laughs> really just made me think about so many things about time not being linear, which I feel like really certain it's not, or like time is like a gyre and, and that like that like is possible, like every way that we're kind of interacting with a potential future, you know, is like interacting with with a self future or something and yeah. it's like I just think about this like what just happened with um Joe Biden winning I know I told you I mean this is my own like lame you know interaction with like you know the whatever premonition or something but definitely like for a few weeks I just heard people chanting like Biden Biden and that has happened to me like a few times in my life where it's like I'm just like no no like he's gonna don't worry about it I like heard it and I, you know, at like 1130 here, I, people just started chanting, like they were screaming. I, they weren't being like Biden, but, but you know what I mean? It's like, it was that moment. And I'm really sure that I definitely accessed the future. At least that's how I interpret it. But it's so confusing. Just like, you know, so how do you think time and ghosts and all that, you know, work? Well, I, I like, I think that there's a place of eruption and ecstasy where um, the emotionality of a moment can break it, like is so powerful that it breaks into a different dimension or a different like a different a different time or a different spaceness than what we usually activate in our normal you know kind of everyday life um in brujeria and curanderismo like um traditional folk um uh, folk um uh, traditions in latin american culture um in the traumatic ways we talk about this spiritual element called susto or fright, and that it literally can seem like a soul loss or the loss of your um, your shadow self or your shadow, right? And that it's these moments where you're literally shocked out of yourself. Um, and that there, when that happens, there are pieces that get left in the etheric. Um, and so, um, and so, hey, just thinking about, right, what is the etheric and where, like, how can a piece of me be left in, in you know, a, you know, um, in a non-corporeal space, right? Um, but B, then, you know, as the, the worker, how do we bring that, that soul recovery into, you know, being? How do we kind of um, uh, pull those, those essences um, that were left in those spaces back? Um, and so sometimes like in ghost, um, like specific like poltergeist um, uh, energies, there can be, um, you know, a person who's so traumatic, you know, has so much trauma or is going through so much emotional um, uh, crisis that they're, that, that their parts of themselves are poking out. And so it can either invite other entities in 
or it can be those parts of themselves that are causing like issues in the space because they're not aware that they're distanced from the self. And just as you were talking, like thinking about like those times of high emotionality and because I, I do think that like definitely if I like love someone, I'll be like, oh, they're driving back on their driveway right now. You know, I'll just be sure. But if I don't care, I really couldn't access much about, you know, if somebody's like, can you, you know, like I could never do what you do. You know, can you tell me about my wife? And I'd be like, I don't know, because I don't, you know, care about your wife. It, it was, and But I also was thinking about this idea of anxiety, like, and, you know, when you were saying like the trauma, just like, how does, you know, for example, now is a moment of fear. So how did that anxiety make, give like a shard of the self access to it potentially? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, even how, how you know, a culture can have so loss, you know, generational so loss right? And it can haunt itself. So, you know, uh, all the legacies um, of, um, of those like fright moments get literally discharged in the cellular memory that's passed down from memory to, from, from child to, you know, adult to child. And so um, that there's, it doesn't just rupture the, the time and space in the moment, but it can actually rupture in the DNA. Um, the narrative that go, you know, that, that, that's there. Um, yeah. So, and that, that in terms of time, um, that part of the work is calling back and uplifting, you know, those parts of ourselves, you know, back there, because for me at least time doesn't exist in that like linear way. Um, and so, um, so, so, you know, there, there's, um, yeah, I, I mean, so there's ways of, in you know calling calling it forward or calling it back um and even you know we, that this idea of like praying seven generations you know project seven generations back um and seven generations forward because it takes that long for the next incarnation of the self to fully materialize so that there are parts of our you know lap, like parts of our soul that are that are emanations from seven generations ago and then also that are emanating seven generations now and that the work that we're doing is affecting both of those on either side. I love that so much. Do you feel like, how do you, do you ever feel like something's being channeled through you or that there are entities around you that you connect with that are part of your like imaginative self or your like imaginative space? Well, thank you so much for asking this because um, I want to ask, you know, I want to, I want to ask you more about this and like understand this because I have this problem. I mean, definitely like with poetry where I've always like very, very early, I just started writing poems like no, you know, nobody in my family wrote poem. Nobody like talked about poetry. I mean, they were like smart. My parents were smart, but they weren't never, never, never like a poetry thing. I always, always, always felt I was channeling things. Like I never felt, I, I feel embarrassed to say it, embarrassed and elitist to say it because I want to think that we can, you know, I do think we can teach poetry, create spaces, you know, create space to open up the membranes. But definitely for me, it was not something I ever felt like I chose. And I felt like I was speaking the voices of people that couldn't speak. And that's what I always thought of poetry was and it, it always sometimes would feel like a gift and a lot of times feel like a burden. So I was like, this isn't what I necessarily want to do anyway. Yeah. Do what do you, do you feel that way about like your writing and your work and everything? Or Absolutely. What well, even, I mean, like you're talking about, like, how do you articulate a voice outside of just like what you're hearing? Like what's the, like the emotionality or what's the, because it's not, for me at least, it's not just the voice, it can be a feeling, it can be a, a scene that's being played in my mind, and that all that's like part of the, the spirit of whatever I'm engaging. And so having to verbalize that or being able to like cross the, you know, cross it, you know, cross my own experience into, you know, relating that to an experience that somebody else might have is so difficult. It is so difficult. <laughs> um, and that what I find is at least in terms of my guides and the way the information comes in is that it might not even be about the symbol. It's about my relationship to that symbol. And so they're bringing my attention to the feeling that I have around it. And so that in, then gives me like the X, like it gives me the key of explaining it to the person in front of me. 
So um, like an example, like um, sometimes like whenever I, I draw, you know, a, a specific card, like the hair of Fox in my deck, um, an image pops of this time whenever I was five and this red ball was like, I was playing with this red ball that rolled into this big grove of trees. Mm -hmm. And I look, looked up and it was just one of those moments of like seeing spirit, you know, just like feeling the joy and ecstasy of being, right? Um, and then it was like over in a second. So like sometimes that image pops up. And so if I explain that, like I'm seeing a kid with a red ball, right? And they're like, what are you doing? Like really, bitch, what are you talking about, right? So, but what, I, what, what, like the way that I try and, you know, kind of articulate it's articulate to the person is what did it feel like when you first had that aha moment or you first felt like presence in your own presence in yourself and that like that that like kind of the arms wrapped around you you know how your aesthetic sense matters and I feel like that's something like as a poet that I've always tried to tell people and also believed so much like it's not it's not um it's not that it's like so so important but it's it's important enough to it's not frivolous information it's not like i i'm you know like the color pink and um you know i just do and oh but you can make it blue it's like no if, if i'm like really doing this thing it's kind of i want to pay attention to my instinct to have it be pink it's not just like a random Thing or whatever I have all these deep associations and that kind of like possibility of translation you know which may not be actually involving language is really like important to to pay attention to like to and respect and respect in yeah. everyone like make sure everyone knows that I feel like you know I feel like that's one way that we keep um, people submissive in society as we take their imaginations down so low and they don't trust the fact that all those things in, like your memory you know memories too or the color whatever is like so valid and that's what you know be, once you don't start trusting that pink is important you start not trusting any of those messages and you just listen to everyone else you know because well, that, that, that's that, that's your magic. Like that's your that's your potency. That was Dorothea Lasky giving her lecture on the materiality of the imagination, followed by a conversation on the supernatural between Lasky, paranormal investigator Vinnie Carbone, and mystic artist and spiritual healer Lou Flores. Next week we'll be back with the Beast: How Poetry Makes Us Human and a conversation with puppeteer Christopher Mullins. Lasky's book of collected Bagley Wright Lecture Series lectures, Animal, was published by Wave Books in 2019 and is available for purchase at wavepoetry.com, via bookshop.org, and at your local independent bookstore. Visit us at our website, bagleywrightlectures.org, for more information about these and other lectures by Joshua Beckman, Dorothy Lasky, Timothy Donnelly, Srikanth Reddy, Terence Hayes, Rachel Zucker, Cedar Saigo, Renee Gladman, Lisa Jarno, and Douglas Kearney, as well as links to supplementary materials on each lecturer's archive page, including selected writings and a link to available books. This podcast was produced by me, Ellen Welker, with help from Caitlin Airy Johnson. Thank you to Seattle Arts and Lectures for partnering with us on this event, and thank you for listening. Music is I Recall by Blue Dot Sessions from the Free Music Archive, CC by NC.